So we're going to learn how to draw a horse. It's real easy, OK? So check this out. Four, five steps. Step one, draw two circles. Step two, draw the legs. It's really coming together now here. See, check. Draw the face, draw the hair. Add some small details. And you've got a beautiful horse. So something's a little bit missing here between step four and five. And a lot of technology is like this when it comes to readme files or instructions or technical blogs that kind of paint this really rosy picture about how easy something is, especially you know, integrating this technology with this technology. I'm going to give you this step-by-step -step guide. I call things like this the, uh, the troll readme. When they, when they leave out the, the really nasty, nitty-gritty details of stuff that you're going to get stuck on, they give you some little getting started guide like this. You know, just npm install this, and then super easy, and that's it. And, and then you're like, right out of the gate, you just like get smacked down, and you run into some problem. And you go, you Google it, you Google the error, you find out there's like thousands of other people who have had this problem, and there's you know, 500 different possible solutions for the problem. And then so your your next step is like, great, I'm already going off on this forked path. Like, which which road do I choose? And it's really frustrating. And so. I worked for Walmart Labs, and we kept running into stuff like this with regards to our end-to-end -end testing strategy when it, when it came to automation. And it, it really sucked. So I wanted to share some of our experiences there. So that's me and my boy up there. And uh, me, not him, uh, work for Walmart Labs. Uh, and, and we create common infrastructure on my team. Uh, we're the core web team. We, we create uh, build and automation tools that other teams use to build out everything about www.walmart.com that, that everybody uh, uses. So we, uh, we, we try to support them with, with common tools and infrastructure, especially with regards to automation uh, to uh, make it so they can spend more time doing fun stuff and less time doing tedious stuff. So we follow the test pyramid, which you may have seen before. Uh, it prescribes that you have a whole lot of unit tests and that you rely on unit tests as your bread and butter for, uh, for, for quality control. Unit tests are fast, they're reliable, they're predictable. They hopefully are, are pretty consistent when they pass and fail. And uh, very easy to run on a dev machine, CI machine. Um, service tests we're not really going to talk about today, but just testing an HTTP endpoint on a server to make sure that it's, it's giving you the response you expect. And then at the tip of the pyramid, just like the sweets on your food pyramid, in moderation, but still have them there, uh, are, the, are the UI tests or the end-to-end -end tests. And these are generally at the tip of the pyramid because they're generally thought to be slower, they're more uh, hard to maintain, they're brittle. But uh, for a good testing strategy, especially with, with a site as, as complex as, as something like Walmart, it's really necessary because when you have a bunch of unit tests that are written by separate teams, there's, no matter how good you are, there's always going to be gaps between this test and this test, especially if it's going across two different functional areas. There's always going to be missed assumptions between, between teams, between developers, between different parts of your stack. And end-to-end -end tests are a good way of just making sure that none of those gaps wind up being a showstopper. So, End-to-end -end tests should also be cross-browser. So everybody should understand what browsers they have to support and which ones they don't have to support because there's a lot of browsers that we're really hoping are going to die off, <coughs> IE8 uh, and friends, uh, as soon as possible. But there's still a depressingly large number of customers using these old browsers. And we know that if we stopped supporting them, we would lose X number of dollars. So it's a huge pain to test them all. It's a huge waste of human time to run through the same scenarios over and over on all these different browsers. And because it's a pain to test, it means you all know what I'm talking about. Like, did you test it on IE? Oh, yeah, I did last, last month, maybe. Um, and QA people you know, are, are the same way, right? They're, they're, not, they're not physically going to have enough time in the day to run all their test cases continuously in all the browsers we have to support. So things are going to slip. There's going to be times when maybe it's a week or two weeks since anybody actually fired up IE8 and ran through 
all of the scenarios to make sure everything still works. And because of that, if somebody finds a bug in IE8, the first question we often ask is, well, when was the last time it worked in IE8? Well, I don't know, I tested it I think three weeks ago. Perfect, let's look at all the commits in the last three weeks and figure out which one caused a regression in a legacy browser. That sucks, <laughs> nobody likes doing that. But what can we do about it, right? So automation, everybody says, that's it. I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna figure out how to automate all this stuff so I don't have to do it by hand anymore. Awesome. How many people have, 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 said, have said that before? That's it, okay, yeah, see, you know what I'm talking about. So pretty much every cross-browser end-to-end testing solution relies on Selenium at its core. So this is a, a great tool, um, open source. It has drivers for every major browser that give you deep hooks into the browser to control it with, with puppet strings to tell it, you know, to, to behave and do any kind of user interaction that a user would do. Click this, fill in this form, navigate here. It has an API uh, that's over HTTP. HTTP. Um, it's not the most friendly API to work with, so there's always a lot of wrappers on top of Selenium that people use. And, um, and there's a lot of companion tools that go along with it, a lot of services like Sauce Labs. This is a diagram of, uh, of uh, Sauce Labs, which we use uh, to outsource the tedious task of maintaining a, fr a farm of different browsers. Uh, there's Browser Stack, there's, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, but there's a whole ecosystem around this because people really want this kind of stuff to work. But when you start putting all these pieces together, companion libraries for Selenium, external services to manage your browsers as a service, it starts to look like this. It's a big Rube Goldberg machine. Um, there's so many points of failure that it's hard to keep track of them all. And guaranteed, anybody who starts down this path sooner or later is gonna run into TestFlake. So when we talk about TestFlake, we're not talking about the tests that developers themselves are writing being flaky. We're not talking about bad application code. We're talking about something in the system, in this big complicated system, failing for really no good reason at all. Creating false positive results, sending developers on a wild goose chase when something fails, only to, to realize Five minutes later, this thing that I've been chasing is now passing unexplained, you know, for, for no good reason, and I just wasted all that time. So, see also, waste everyone's time with this one weird trick. Developers hate this. So anybody who's tried to implement uh, a, a, an end-to-end testing solution has probably had the best of intentions, but has wound up frustrating a whole lot of people if they try to get them to use it. Just a quick plug for a really awesome podcast. If anybody hasn't checked out Rebecca Murphy's TTL podcast, uh, definitely check it out. It's all about front-end ops and this emerging discipline. Um, I was on, I think, episode four, uh, talking about some of this same stuff in, in more detail. Um, but the, the really cool thing to hear was, was everybody else on the interviews before me, she asked them if they, if they were doing end-to-end -end testing, and they said, we really want to, but it's just not really worth the time, because it's just so flaky, it's so frustrating. So, you know, this, this, this was really actually good to hear because it, it lent a lot of credibility to this fight that we're trying to fight. Even on Google's own Google testing blog, there was this great article called Just Say No to More End-to-End -end Tests. Like, I thought this was clickbait because it was such a, you know, like, bold uh, title here. But, like, they made some really, really good points. Um, but my favorite line here was that they, they compared end-to-end -end testing to... Uh, going to a movie with your friends that you all wanted to see and then you all regretted watching afterwards. Like a good idea that just failed in practice. But they talk about a lot of good points in here. They talk about end-to-end -end tests being slow, unreliable, flaky, and that they don't isolate failures. So at the end of the day, while they have the best intentions, they end up just wasting more time than they save. So we said, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're, we're gonna really fix this, right? We, we, have a, we have a team of people, we asked for some time to, to like focus on this for a few months, so we got this, right? So we decided we're gonna create an end-to-end -end testing solution uh, that's going to work for dev and QA alike, so, so non-technical people should be able to write tests, there shouldn't be a high barrier to entry. It should be fast enough to run as part of our CI system, and no flake, absolutely not acceptable, 
we want to win the hearts and minds of developers in QA, and we're going to have no tolerance for false positives. So for the first goal of, uh, of, of having tests that are simple enough to write for, for QA as well, we picked a companion library, uh, a Node.js based adapter called Nightwatch. It's one of the more popular ones. There's a lot of them that are really good that talk to Selenium through a Node API to make the, the API a little bit more palatable to work with. And Nightwatch is awesome, and we made some really great progress with it right off the bat. We were taming these browsers. We got a Sauce Labs subscription. We had a huge collaborative test writing effort between developers and QA, and we were rocking. We were getting just every green check mark we saw, we were thinking of, we're saving this many hours of manual time, and, and QA is loving us, and developers are going to love us because we're going to catch these regressions sooner rather than later. So we started running these tests, just you know, hundreds of them every hour and all the time, and increasing our browser matrix more and more, going back, to, you know, testing IE 8, 9, 10, 11, Firefox, last couple versions, Chrome, Safari, mobile emulators. Everything was golden. And every now and then, we'd see something like this. We'd be like, oh, a test failure. Great, our tool caught something in the wild. Let's go, let's go fix it. And then five minutes later, oh, oh past that time. Hmm. OK, well, just a little glitch, nothing to worry about. And then like 10 minutes later, oh, that one failed. OK, nothing to worry about. You know, We'll just kind of like sweep that under the, oh, OK. And then, oh, no, no, why is it passing now? And so we, we got really, really quickly, like the old 80-20 rule, right? Like we got really close to this 80% mark of being super happy. And then we were just like, ah, like we were so close to feeling like this was a, a complete solution. And in the end, we had the same problems with flakiness as everybody else, despite trying to design with, with overcoming these very specific flaky things from the beginning, we still got burned by this. So let's, let, we, we thought, okay, we need to change our mindset here. We've been, we've been, we, we need, we, we had this realization like, whoa, we, okay, we've been trying to think of end-to-end -end tests like unit tests, like a, a predictable environment that we can control, but, but in reality, they're, they're nothing like that at all. So we came up with this little metaphor of soup. A can of soup is like a test result when you're hungry, okay? I'm hungry, I wanna have some soup for lunch, I want to be able to test my code, I want to run this test, and I want to get a test result back, a binary pass-fail, which is, which is like reaching and, and getting a can of soup. So stick with me here. With a unit test, it's like going and grabbing a can of soup from your own kitchen cupboard. You're controlling the safety of your own house, it's very safe, it's quick and easy, it's right there, you just have to reach right there and grab it. And so that's why everybody loves unit tests, they're predictable, they're easy. End-to-end -end tests are different. So end-to-end -end tests, you want your can of soup. First, you have to get in your car. Next, you have to drive through a zombie apocalypse on the way to the grocery store. Who knows what's going to happen? When you get to the grocery store, the store might be overrun by zombies. And once you actually grab your can of soup, you might have to like, fight to the death on your, on your way out to try to get home. So in this metaphor, the, the lurking zombies are all of these things that we have encountered as being sources of test flake. There's bugs in the web drivers themselves. This, this goes back to that troll readme thing. It's like none of, the, none of the readmes for these things talk about all of these common sources of flake that like everybody quickly discovers. The web drivers themselves have bugs, i.e. driver. It's like 5% of the time when you tell Selenium to click on a button, it says that it did it, but it didn't really click it. Oh well, flaky network. So like I said, everything runs over HTTP. When you're, when you're doing hundreds and thousands of tests per day, and you have these really chatty Selenium clients talking to these remote servers across different networks and data centers, inevitably you're gonna have some, some packet loss here and there. And just one little dropped packet here and there can just make a test blow up or time out, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then sometimes the services themselves might have bugs or outages or you know, a VM just fails to spin up and, and a test fails. And we, we tried to you know, treat these things like a whack-a-mole problem where we just deal with each one at a time. But even months into this project, we were still hitting new problems that we had never seen before. 
And we'd, we'd, you know, some of these problems were super obscure. We would Google them and we'd find you know, one person with a, a, a post you know, from 2006 with the same problem and then no response or like, like that XKCD comic, what did you see? <laughs> but we really quickly realized this is a losing battle. So there, there's going to be new problems every day. We can't possibly fix them all. But what do we do? Do we just give up? And we had this, this moment where we said, what if, what if we could just make all of these flaky tests not flaky anymore without actually fixing the individual problems? This was a very like Morpheus moment here. How can we make the tests not flaky without actually fixing anything? So we had to go back and think about some more geeky stuff here. So from the point of view of the consumers of our tool, the developers who are going to be running these tests and the QA people who are going to be writing these tests, the notion of a pass-fail, or a can of soup in this metaphor, is an axiom in, 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 in a mathematical proof. It's a premise or a starting point of reasoning, a premise so evident as to be accepted as true without controversy. If we broke that axiom, we've lost everybody. If nobody trusts our tool to be accurate, they're not going to use it. They're not going to pay attention to it when it breaks. And so we had to make it so that this axiom was true no matter what. And making it true was actually more important than how we made it true. And this is where things get a little bit scary. We did some dirty stuff, really dirty stuff, duct tape and rubber bands, like don't look under the covers stuff to make some of these tests pass. We figured out, OK, if an assertion fails the first time, let's just try it again and see if it passes the second time. And if it fails that time, let's try it again like a few hundred milliseconds later and see if it passes that time. We found out, like, hey, that seems like a really ugly hack, but that makes tests pass 50% more of the time than it used to. And then we had these like, IE driver bugs, like, oh, that click thing that said it clicked but didn't work. What if instead of using the buggy Selenium driver for click events, what if we actually inject jQuery into the page if it's not already there and actually do a jQuery click event? And that smoothed over like another 25% of the tests. So we were kind of like addicted to this, to this like new sort of like fighting dirty kind of, kind of method for, for, for dealing with our zombies. But we were, we were making huge progress and we were starting to see fewer and fewer of those false positives. So this is where we kind of had this major breakthrough where we were gaining momentum and we were smoothing over all these bumps in, in kind of non-optimal ways, but the momentum that we were gaining was much more important than how, what we had to do to gain that momentum. And we started thinking of this in a different mindset that not all problems require precision solutions. Sometimes you just have to smooth over the speed bump to move on. So we kind of ended up with something like this. Instead of getting in your car to get to the grocery store, you get into this. You get into this armored convoy. This is, this is, this is the, uh, the tool that we built. And it's going to get you to the grocery store, one way or the other. Is it overkill? Yes, no question about it. Is it, is it computationally expensive, all the stuff that we're doing? No question. Making the test run slower with all these retries and things? Yeah, not going to argue with that. But does it fix the reliability problem? Hell yes, it did. Anybody watch The Walking Dead? So when they come to a zombie, do they like, do they say, do they say oh, a zombie, guess I'm dead now. No, they drive, like sometimes they just drive through herds of zombies and you know, turn on the windshield wipers and like, they get to the other side, right? So that's what you have to do in today's world of end-to-end -end testing to get to this point. So we're back at this point now. We're getting tests running. We're going days and weeks without seeing any false positives. And when we do see a test failure, we don't even have to investigate it anymore ourselves. We can just send this directly to the, uh, to the developer who owns the test and say, hey, check this out. Looks like IE9 is broken when you try to view your cart. And it used to be that we'd be shaking in our shoes whenever we'd have that conversation because we'd be worried, is it going to turn out to be our problem? And then we just pissed off a developer because we're going to waste their time. 
But now it's like, oh, thanks, man. Like, you just saved me from having to pull an all-nighter when we, when we launch next week. So we're back to this point where we're making great progress. We hit our speed bump. We do what we have to do to smooth it over, and we're there. We've got a reliable end-to-end -end test suite running on our complete browser support matrix. It's made out of kludgy duct tape and rubber bands, but it works. So the next thing we thought, we started, we started hearing like, hey, this is cool. Like, have you guys thought about open, open sourcing this? And we were like, nobody, nobody wants to like open this can of spam and see like what's in there. You know, it's like, okay, this is helping us, but like, we're not, we're not proud of what's going on in there. We thought this is not suitable to release, right? Because just because that's that's kind of the mindset of of development as as a craft, and like you know, you create these small lightweight tools, you publish them on npm, they're elegant, they solve a tiny little problem in like seven lines of code, and this was like a monstrosity that we created. You know, it was it was good solid code, but the things that we did to make it work just felt felt dirty. So you know, did we feel like we were a bunch of clever engineers? Like, yeah, we felt like we were shoveling shit and we got the job done, but at the end of the day. We're shoveling shit. But then we thought, huh, OK. We thought about our journey. And this is where we ended up. But what would have happened if we hadn't thought about that whole axiom of truth thing and, and pushed on no matter what? And how many others must have tried and, and given up? How many other individuals, how many teams, how many companies got 30%, 70%, 80% of the way? and wasted so much time trying to make it work and then just gave up because they couldn't find an elegant, clean solution. And how many more people in the future were going to do that? And then so we started thinking about what's the responsible thing to do? And what if we could take all of that wasted effort in the future and actually add it on to the point of after, like, after the problem that we solved of making tests not flaky anymore, what if we could have people contributing to other more interesting parts of end-to-end -end testing after that? Because we had started moving on to cooler problems ourselves. We realized, okay, we have these tests running, but we don't have a good way of going back and historically looking at trends about what passed when and who broke what and which browsers were failing together. So we forked the uh, jQuery test swarm project, which already had a really nice dashboard, which they use for um, keeping track of their unit tests cross-browser for, for jQuery. And we made this work with our end-to-end -end tests. So we were running builds at regular intervals every hour, two hours. And if there was a failure, we could get a very narrow slice where we could say, oh, an IE8 regression was introduced between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock today. And that gives you a very small number of commits to go and look at. And then when somebody claims that they fixed it, we just wait for the next iteration of the build to run. And then we can see, oh, sweet, everything is green again. After that, we implemented a uh, massively parallel test runner. So instead of just running these tests one at a time on each uh, remote browser, we could run 10, 15, 50 tests at once. So we could compress down the total time it takes to execute this entire matrix of tests from an hour to an hour and a half into more like 15 or 20 minutes. And that gave us the freedom to run these, these builds not only just at a regular interval, but actually as part of our pull request verification. We use, we use GitHub internally, and so it gives you that nice border around your merge box that says, all good to merge, or you know, hey, you failed the build. So now we can have our remote Sauce Labs cross-browser builds actually contributing to that to that safety check of saying to a developer whether it's cool to merge or not. So remember that Google criticism about just say no to end-to-end -to -end tests because they're too slow? Well, because we smoothed over that speed bump and we could move on to cooler problems, we got to actually tackle that problem. And we found a pretty good solution for it. So it's no longer hard to isolate failures because we can run this on every pull request. Now we had this nagging feeling about what about the flake, right? What are we sweeping under the rug when we're retrying what if there's legitimate issues in the app code? Maybe a timing issue. Maybe there's something that in the app code actually fails 2% of the time. And are we just sweeping that under the rug? So we started actually looking at the data that we're collecting through TestSwarm. We've got a big database of 
historically all the tests we've run, how many times each test has retried, what user agent it ran with. And so we could start producing graphs like this. It's kind of hard to see at the bottom, but we've got uh, a list of all of our user agents, um, you know, uh, browser vendor version and um, operating system. So we can sort and start seeing what are our biggest problems. Here we can see that we've got the most test flake. We've got like, you know, 9.7% uh, retry rate for our iOS simulators. So this could be a problem with the simulator itself. This could be a problem with how our code is working in a responsive scenario. But it gives us a narrower window to look at instead of just giving up and saying, oh, the tests are flaky. What do I do? We can say, yeah, but they're more flaky on this browser than this one. So that gives somebody who wants to investigate a little bit more to go on. We can also slice by the test names themselves. So if we start to see uh, particular uh, groups of tests that all test common features uh, that are failing more frequently together, then that's a feature that a developer should, should look into. So Google and, and, and some of these other uh, companies that have tried this, we're all, we're all trying to summit the same mountain together, right? But because a lot of them got really stuck on the flaky part, they never got to research the more interesting things. And we're at the point now where we're re researching the sources of the flake and starting to narrow down this problem that seemed just totally insurmountable before. So we're going to open source this. Right now we have a code name called Magellan. Uh, because we're a large company, we have, to, we have to run all of our open source stuff through a lengthy review process, and the name is likely to change. But uh, look for this to be open sourced soon. Um, what Magellan actually is, is an end-to-end -end test runner that hooks into other libraries, such as Nightwatch or WD. So it's not a replacement for Nightwatch or Protractor or all of these, but you can think of it as a test runner runner. So it's a, it's a commander for your fleet or a conductor for your orchestra. And it does a few very specific things. It smooths over test flake, but gives you insight into what's flaky. Uh, it's a massively parallel test runner that compresses down your, your uh, runtime of your suite. And it gives you uh, beautiful reporting tools like we saw um, from our test swarm fork so that you can make sense of it all. So we came to think of this as, instead of shoveling shit as being like something we should be ashamed of, this is shoveling shit as a service. Not as a service on a server, but as a service to your fellow developers and to your community. I've never actually like coined a, a hashtag before, but I want to see this trending on all of the stuff that you've done that you've kind of been like a little bit ashamed of, but like would really be useful to everybody because it solves a problem, even if it's a messy problem. Shovel that shit and, and do it for the benefit of, of everybody else. So how do we, how do, what, are the, what are the core tenets of shit shoveling 101? Momentum is, is greater than perfection. So getting stuck on shitty problems is demoralizing, it's unproductive, and there's no point. Get that momentum. Smoothing things over is better than giving up. So I'll think of all of those 80% solved problems that never saw the light of day because somebody just couldn't do it as cleanly as they wanted to. That's a shame. There's so much wasted effort there. Useful is better than precise. So if you can help someone else smooth over a bump, it doesn't matter how much duct tape and rubber bands, how much dirty stuff you had to do to get there. If you can be useful to somebody else and package that up, they can get over a speed bump that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. And open source is better than closed source. If you built a tool like this, you think, well, maybe I'll release it one day when I can polish it all up. No, release it when it's useful, even if it's only marginally useful in, such, in some small way. So you can follow me at geek underscore Dave if you want to uh, be notified when, when Magellan is out in the wild or whatever it's called at the time. Uh, if you want to check out the podcast uh, on Rebecca Murphy's show, check out ttlpodcast.com. We talk for a long time about um, everything that Magellan does in a lot more detail. And for real, use this hashtag. Shovel that shit. Thanks. Mm -hmm.